good evening and welcome to this uh, session, the Mandarin Prosa, offline, online or on the line, where we are discussing the red tech, the hardware, software, rules and protocols shaped by the Communist Party of China. As China's economic influence and technological capabilities have grown, it has sought to exercise its influence beyond its borders by manipulating global publics and exerting control over the channels through which data and technologies flow. How should democracies and open societies, which are committed to protect the rule of law, safeguard their citizens from harms posed by malicious actors, collaborate together, and protect their systems and institutions? My name is Sami Patil, and I'll be your moderator for this dinner session. And I have a fantastic panel to moderate. On my right is Lieutenant General Rajesh Pant, National Cyber Security Coordinator, National uh, Security Council Secretariat, Government of India. Adam Seagal, Director of the Digital and Cyberspace Policy Program at the Council for Foreign Relations, United States. Yuka Koshino, Research Fellow of the Digital and Cyberspace Policy Program, sorry, uh, Research Fellow for Security and Technology Policy at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, UK. Nella Liosk, Ambassador at Large for Digital Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Estonia. Okay, and let me get this Gilbert's name right. Gilbert Nyanjinji, CEO, Africa Cyber Defense Forum, Kenya. So I'll begin this by asking each of the panelists to make an opening comment for about four minutes on how do they see the specter of red tech. May I start with Lieutenant General Pant? Over to you, sir. Thank you, Samir, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We don't want to delay your dinner, so you better keep your questions also short. But uh, thanks to ORF for this exciting panel. Uh, China today is uh, not the mystery wrapped in an enigma as it used to be. Whatever I say here is personal, firstly. I mean, I can't express the views of the government on such a sensitive subject. But uh, when we see China, and we can start with the 100-year marathon of uh, Michael uh, Pillsbury as to how they've gone about things in a very uh, detailed manner, deliberate manner, 2013, the Belt and Road Initiative, 2025, your uh, Make in China, 2035, China Standards, 2049, when they celebrate 100, year, 100 years of their nationhood and become the number one economy in the world. Everything has gone as per a, a fixed plan. And where they stand today is, uh, is, is indeed impressive. I mean, whichever field we take, uh, whether we take their strides in um, quantum, they have uh, the fastest uh, co uh, computer, also the first operating system for quantum they have. In 5G also, uh, almost 70% of the 5G deployments are uh, Chinese. Uh, they have their own uh, Harmony operating system, which is a cross-platform operating system, works on their uh, radio also in space, uh, biotech, uh, genome, uh, robotics, uh, semiconductors, they've come down to almost seven nanometer. Uh, they've made strides in, uh, you know, in, in all other areas of technology. And that is where the question of uh, the weaponization of technology and the weaponization of interdependence, as it is called, uh, these terms are being used. So uh, the uh, discussion today is on how open societies uh, can counter it. I think uh, actions have already started if you uh, see what we've done on a, a plurilateral sort of a platform like Quad. Um, uh, a number of initiatives have been taken. It is not the uh, security only that is being addressed. There's this climate, there's uh, uh, semiconductors. I lead a Quad uh, senior uh, cyber group uh, where uh, we've devised various strategies. Uh, then uh, we have an initiative called the Counter Ransomware Initiative. Uh, where a group of 37 uh, nations have uh, come together and a number of actions are being done in that and various other aspects uh, of uh, uh, trusted supply chain. You must have heard of the Indian uh, directive on the uh, trusted uh, national security directive on the trusted uh, telecom sector uh, where uh, uh, we have mandated uh, that uh, any equipment uh, connected uh, to the telecom network of India will be a trusted equipment from a trusted source. And what is a trusted equipment? What is a trusted source? There is a process behind it. I am the designated authority for that uh, process. And uh, we are going about things in a very deliberate manner, seeing where, uh, you know, up even the equipment, we are going down to the 
a level of the active uh, programmable semiconductors. So we're going down to the si silicon level and seeing where that is coming from, who's the ultimate beneficiary of that, et cetera. So uh, two sectors we have addressed square and uh, uh, upfront. Uh, one is the telecom sector, second is the power sector. Because these two sectors we consider as uh, supercritical sectors. Uh, in the power sector, in all the verticals of transmission, generation, distribution, grid operations, including non-renewable energy, we've established uh, the security incident response teams, security operation center have been established, CISOs have been trained, their uh, uh, central electricity authority, which is the regulator for this sector, has issued extensive guidelines. So power and telecom, uh, we are handling other sectors also, we have created FinCert, et cetera. But this is at a national level. At an international level, as I said, um, for uh, open societies, it is what is called as the coalition of the willing. So uh, uh, there are these like-minded countries which have come to together in various platforms uh, which are taking action. I think I'll take a pause there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, may I call on Yuka to give her opening remarks? Yes, of course. Um, thank you very much for having me today. Um, so I wanted to uh, maybe tackle the question of how, uh, the in the description on how open society should protect the role space um, law um, in, in, and to, to band together and buck for the system of in institutions. So one of the major challenges, um, common challenges for open democratic society um, is the gap between the challenges from China in digital space being multi-layered, um, as uh, the Lieutenant General uh, mentioned, it's, um, it's ranging from economic security and also strategic in, a, in the sense that it is something, it's more of a ecosystem of, of exporting um, technologies, but also roles in the governance system along with it. Um, and then also the, the other dimension of the challenge is the fragmented nature um, of the government and the society to tackle um, this multi-layer challenge. Um, and both the fragmentation between the various ministries and agencies involved in the digital technologies or digital governance um, issues around policy issues around digital space and also the fragmentation between the government and industries. And the industrial competition, even among the like-minded partners, are also serving as constraints uh, for cooperation among the uh, like-minded partners, despite the shared concerns and common goals to ensure somewhat like free, open, secure, and trusted digital domains. So in my opening remarks, I would like to highlight um, several areas on how Japan has kind of taken somewhat innovative or proactive approaches um, and unique approaches to um, both domestically and internationally to address these holistic challenges and to, to address the issues of fragmentations in dem democratic society. So one is um, really what um, underscoring what Lieutenant General mentioned, but the understanding of how this China challenge in the digital domain is complex and multi-layered. It's economic challenge in a sense that um, the boost of Chinese uh, tech, uh, you know, um, digital communications technology and platform technology is enabled by massive kind of unfair um, subsidies and loans um, given to specific Chinese, uh, pre preferred uh, Chinese technology companies. It is a security challenges because of the, um, the, the intelligence uh, law that China has, which allows Chinese companies to um, use these technologies for security purposes. And then also it's strategic in a sense that um, it's a whole ecosystem that China is trying to build and export to um, that is preferable um, for, for China, um, Chinese um, technology firms. So the role of government has actually increased uh, to tackle this national challenge and economic security challenges to actively foster cooperation um, and with the like-minded partners. So secondly was um, for Japan's unique approach is more on the domestic realm is the upgrading of domestic policy making apparatus to boost capability and capacity of the government to craft a holistic strategy and the implementation to deal with this issue. So a notable initiative was the establishment, for instance, of the economic um, division within the National Security Council, which is the highest level of government of policy make decision making body in the, in the Japanese government on national security issues. And um, it was set up to kind of um, assess and review and form the, the responses to national security risks and geoeconomic challenges, such as 5G security risks or Chinese digital Silk Road strategies and its implications or civil military fusion strategies and the links of Japanese companies and research institutes um, that might be providing sensitive technologies for Chinese militaries. 
Um, and then under this kind of movement, the, the term economic security has kind of current immersed. It's not industrial security. It's an air policy area that uh, has in, you know, intersection between economic and security issues. And then in 2021, Tokyo established the world's first economic security minister to tackle this intersected um, challenges of the economic and security issues to form a whole of government response. So the defense ministry was involved, um, foreign ministry was involved, the communication ministry was involved, and the science and technology um, um, uh, education ministry was also involved, and it also passed the nas nation's first economic security legislation, which set the national kind of framework uh, to both enhance the defensive and the, the more offensive side of um, this challenge, including regulations on foreign vendors for critical infrastructure or promoting cybersecurity in critical infrastructure um, or promotion of digital technologies as well, not just the defensive measures um, that has security implications like the 5G or artificial intelligence or quantum technologies um, and even trying to um, cooperate for scanner sending for um, 6G. And then um, the final aspect is the, the beyond enhancing the domestic measures. Um, Japan also um, launched several initiatives to foster cooperation with like-minded partners under the free and open Indo-Pacific vision. So FOIP, um, this vision is called FOIP, is Japan's principle-based foreign policy and geoeconomic strategy that was launched um, by former Prime Minister Abe back in 2016 uh, to seek um, to kind um, approaches to counter Chinese challenges against the role space border. But this vision was also a useful um, vision and a tool to foster cooperation in the digital domain, uh, to aggregate resources and, and capabilities to counter the spread of digital technologies and infrastructures um, with security concerns, but also to proactively set rules and standards and norms in digital space based on the free, open, and inclusive principles, such as spearheading um, you know, measures to counter data protectionism through CPTPP or DFSP in the G20, or promoting um, quality infrastructure financing on digital connectivity, like the undersea cables, and also using mini laterals like the Quad, um, like the Lieutenant in general mentioned, uh, to agree on common approaches on future standard setting process. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Gilbert, how do you see it from London and Nairobi? Yeah, interesting one, because I think where um, I see maybe the, uh, you know, based in London, uh, of course, representing Africa Cyber Defense Forum. So I think I see the issue in more or less um, 360 lens, both from the Western eye and, of course, from the glo you know global South and the, you know uh, developing countries perspective. So basically, the China issue, for example, when it comes to the influence of China in terms of technology, is quite clear. I mean, the dominance of China, uh, it's really, really something that we've seen. Uh, if you look at, for example, uh, countries like, I'll give an example, typical country like Kenya, for example, where we've seen where China has adopted uh, a strategy of concessional loans, for example, where you find that, you know, uh, dominant uh, Chinese companies, for example, like Huawei, uh, you know, are winning tenders through, you know, concessional loans where, for example, there's this um, narrative of, uh, uh, that is being pushed, uh, you know, in the what we call smart cities. And i give a typical example is, uh, for example, in Kenya was Konza, Konza Technolo Technopolis, was Ken Konza City, uh, which was a project that was uh, funded by the, you know, China and, um, and Chinese government through cons concessional loans uh, at a tune of around 17.5 um, billion Kenyan shillings, 17 billion. So it's, you're talking about around uh, uh, 173 million dollars. Now the interesting approach with this is that this aggressive, I mean, there's nothing wrong with concessional loans per se in terms of, uh, you know, projects, but we see it more of a, an approach that is you know, adopted by China uh, where, for example, because what happens with concessional loans is that basically they are funded by the state and of course the interest rates are lower compared to maybe normal market rates. But what happens is that they come also with stringent conditions where some of these countries have to buy the technologies, you know, Chinese uh, technologies, for example, in this case. Uh, I remember, for example, if you look at um, uh, the research paper done by the UN uh, on, you know, the Chinese um, uh, in, in, in influence in Kenya, for example, where they realized that, for example, I think it was around $10 billion that was given to, to Huawei. And uh, in this, I think $200 million, um, you know, was, uh, for example, Nigeria, I had to buy Huawei equipment. So what you're realizing is that 
with this model where you know it's uh, state uh, backed uh, you know this level of state backed uh, chinese influence is that these countries end of the day yes uh, these countries end up getting dev developed infrastructure uh, you know at uh, maybe uh, you say okay fine these projects have opportunity to maybe transform these countries however the issue comes in that you know and uh, even for example adam to your left will agree with this is that the some of these projects are skewed in the sense that they are more um uh, uh, you know, serving Chinese interest than serving the interests of host states. And uh, uh, also the issue also that you realize is that some of these countries where, for example, maybe the rule of law or the context of um, the framework, both uh, uh, in uh, terms of governance and the rule of law, might not be too strong or strengthened, um, the government or, the, you know, the, some of these governments can end up, you know, abusing their powers in the name of um, national security and intelligence to end up, you know, st uh, st you know, st uh, you know uh, stifling, uh, you know, uh, what we call uh, civil liberties and freedoms uh, in the name of uh, national security. So that's to me the threat I see rather uh, in this, you know, to just to, to build on that context of the Chinese influence is that yes, there's this influence we are seeing, but also there's the risk that we are also seeing. Uh, how do we counter this risk? Yes, somebody comes to you, yes, I'm giving you $10 million. Yes, it helps you build your highway, <laughs> but underneath there's a bomb in it. So what happens if this, <laughs> this road you know, uh, you know, is, is, is really coming with something in it? So basically I think that's the thing, and you're seeing it across, not only in Kenya, for example. I think the same case happened, for example, in Botswana, where I think they had to, uh, you know, CCTV cameras were actually, I think, a part of the project agreement was that they had to be, uh, you know, cameras and equipment that were, you know, supplied by Chinese uh, uh, technology firms. So the issue we are facing here is that, um, and I think this ties as well on, on uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, project in 1998 of the um, um, so-called uh, Golden Shield project if those who are conversant with the Golden Shield project, which now, of course, we have been talking about the great um, firewall, right? That is a great firewall. So basically, we see that model. I mean, we might not uh, say, okay, fine, exactly, uh, but as, as, uh, you know, you see already uh, that level of, um, of um, mo model, because why am I saying this? If you look at, for example, is it in 2019, where Chinese um, researchers we're actually proposing a different, uh, you know, IP protocol to the internet. And I think this is something that is quite clearly documented, if you read. And uh, the Chinese government used its influence, you know, through the uh, United Nations and a team of experts who are pro presenting a different uh, model of the uh, IP protocol that as we know it today. And if you read it contextually, realize that the new model being proposed is actually giving the state more control or the, you know, uh, the internet service providers, they w it's possibly a kill switch in this, and <laughs> which might really be abused. And the, the, the problem is that people are even feeling, there's a feeling that already because maybe it might be blocked at the UN, but what if already is being deployed, this structure is already being deployed in uh, these countries, uh, you know, developing countries. So you realize that with this influence, with the money behind it, uh, you know, China has that influence to be able to influence the, the next uh, IP protocol that might not be, you know, friendly to democratic societies. Thank you. Thank you. From my right to my left, but not necessarily in terms of the ideology. Uh, Nella, how do you see the, the specter of red tech? Thank you. Um, I was asked to, to talk whether at all, and if yes, how small states can have a say or influence in this process. So Estonia is a country of 1.4 million people and uh, I'm um, here today to discuss big countries. So I'm optimistic and, uh, and I definitely say that yes, we can have a, we can have a role in, in this process. Estonia is um, not a country that is a, let's say a birthplace of technological innovation per se. So we are not the trendsetter for technological developments. However, Estonia has become the world leader in digitalization and especially in the, in the public sector digitalization and is also very well known for uh, its very high uh, cybersecurity level. And how this has happened actually uh, shows um, uh, some of these aspects that we could perhaps uh, take into account when we talk about small states. 
So what Estonia has done, uh, and has done very smartly, is actually been the fast adopter of these technological uh, trends. So following these trends and really analyzing and seeing whether and how these new technologies could be beneficial for Estonia, for our economic development, for better governance, for social inclusion, um, and so forth. But this has also meant that at times, you, you need to take risks and you need to embrace in innovation at the same time, of course, making sure that, that our people feel safe and their rights and uh, are protected in the, in the virtual world. So yes, on the one hand, we can say that having very clear principles and rules and norms are important for this uh, development. But on the other hand, we cannot forget that we need to be technologically stronger. We need to be innovative. And, and often it seems that the other part in our discourse is somehow secondary. So we, we focus heavily on, uh, on the rules and norms, but not that much on the practice, which is actually needed for creating any trust in, in digital because it, it comes uh, as, as as trust is, is an emotional feeling, you need a good practice to develop trust, apart also from having the regulations. So some of these innovations um, uh, of Estonia, digital identity, uh, uh, interoperability, have also served as role models for interoperability framework for the European Union, for the EIDAS framework of the European Union, which in turn uh, as we have seen also happening with the GDPR, have started to influence uh, the practices and approaches of some other countries. Of course, not all countries. Of course, not all big countries that will have their ways. But some countries do look around for examples, practices, what has gone wrong, what has, not, what has worked, and learn from, these, um, uh, learn from these examples. So we can say that a small country, such as Estonia, can also be a standard setter in some specific, um, uh, specific areas. But uh, I would like to also bring out that no country or government can, can do it alone, and especially small countries. And we talk here so much about uh, uh, collaboration, but, uh, uh, but we haven't, um, I would say, even among like-minded countries, actually realized uh, we have not really made that collaboration work in all aspects. Um, for example, in, um, in Estonia, we develop part of our critical infrastructure, our data sharing uh, platform, together with Finland and Iceland. So there are some examples where we see that like-minded nations come together and they pool resources together and they develop certain technologies or solutions that they need together. But there are, we are at the very early stages. We see very little of that uh, level cooperation even in the, in the European Union. For example, in, uh, in data sharing or identity or actually very many other solutions that we all need. Um, perhaps 20, 25 years ago we, we thought that we, we are also different in our needs and in a way we are different. But there are also a lot of similarities among uh, public sector organizations, but also across countries. We all need to provide certain services to our, our people. We all need land le registry. We all need uh, digital uh, signature. And in, in COVID times, I think we, we saw that even the COVID applications were all developed separately, but actually rather similar across, the, um, across countries in terms of their um, uh, functionalities. So, uh, so I, I, I think here the, I would say, reborn trend, and I think it's going to be discussed tomorrow also here in, in, in the evening session, around um, openness and, and reuse um, uh, is something that, uh, that we should also uh, take a closer look and, and also find ways to develop certain things together. Thank you. Adam? Uh, thank you. So. Um, I certainly don't question the idea that uh, China has uh, long-term plans and uh, strategies, and it has been very successful uh, accomplishing many of them. 
Uh, but for purpose of conversation and to think about um, the future trajectory, let me just introduce four areas of tension or weakness uh, as China moves to the forward. Uh, the first is, uh, I think the Chinese are very aware that um, they are entering a period where uh, disruptive technologies, they have to move now. Uh, if they don't seize the opportunity, then they will lose out on this next wave of innovation like they did in the 90s and the 80s and before that. Uh, and that intensity of, of, of action is really uh, behind a lot of the uh, movements from Xi Jinping and others to, to seize that opportunity. But we should not forget that they are worried that they might not seize it, that that may fail on that. Second, we have just seen a remarkable effort to reshape uh, the domestic technology sector in China, right? We're coming out after a year where the Chinese government was more than willing to wipe off almost a trillion dollars worth of value from social media and other platforms to achieve uh, specific political and economic goals to, uh, to control what they saw as many of the excesses of capitalism, to uh, beat down the companies as uh, independent power brokers, to focus them from soft technology to hard technology, uh, but we don't know how that's going to play out. Right? We don't know what kind of uh, messages it's sent to young entrepreneurs, what it's going to do to future innovation uh, and development. Um, and they are going to find out what happens with the newest round of US sanctions. Like They're clearly going to have uh, a kneecapping effect on the Chinese chip industry. Uh, and I don't think they've really had any time to think about what the long-term considerations are going to be. So we are really entering a stage where China's the system that we saw operate for the last 10 years could be fundamentally shifting. Now the Chinese are already talking about spending more for basic R&D, uh, becoming more uh, technologically self-reliant, but we just don't know where that's going. Third, um, the Chinese are clearly worried about uh, international alliances, the Quad, the TTC, and other types of efforts to align around values or other things, right? What is the constant messaging coming from China right now? We don't want to have a Cold War in technology. We're not the ones talking about uh, a block. We believe that we can all continue to benefit from globalized innovation that has helped everyone. Now, we can go into the uh, specifics about if they've acted that way, but they are clearly worried about uh, AUKUS and the Quad and all of us in the uh, liberal democracies getting our act together on technology cooperation because the Chinese don't really have any other friends to turn to. It's not as if uh, North Korea or Pakistan uh, or others are going to provide the technology that they've managed to um, uh, absorb from the West. Uh, and Chinese scientists are still um, collaborating uh, globally with uh, scientists in the, in the US and the EU and Australia uh, and other places. So that is a clearly uh, a, a huge uh, um, risk for them and one that they are messaging about how they don't want to have blocks. Uh, fourth and finally, um, we are entering a stage where red is more important than expert, right? If you look at the history of Chinese science and technology, there was always a tension between uh, policymakers, did you come from a technical background or did you come from an ideological political background? So Cultural Revolution being the high point of the red over the expert, and over the last 30 years, we've generally seen experts be in the lead. But uh, given what's happened with Xi moving forward, we are now moving back to a stage where expert is going to, uh, red is going to matter. Uh, it's not clear that experts won't matter, but uh, red is, is coming back, uh, and there's going to be some cost clearly to the system uh, on how it learns uh, and how it reacts. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I think those are four areas where we can kind of think about where China may actually stumble. Thank you. In fact, uh, that point about being red more than the expert actually is also the characteristic of the recent military reforms which uh, China has undertaken since uh, 2015. But now let me turn to uh, Reverend Jan Pant. Uh, so you spoke about the counter ransomware initiative uh, and the fact that how the democracies are coming together to, uh, to tackle this particular challenge. Can you tell us more about it? Sure. So uh, this started on 14th of uh, 
October last year as an initiative of uh, Ms. Ann Neuberger, Deputy NSA of Cyber and CET of the US. And she convened a meeting of, uh, uh, as you said, like-minded nations on how we can uh, combine our resources because the criminals had got together. And uh, you've heard of ransomware, the service. Earlier, only a few technical criminals could conduct ransomware operations, but then the access broker got together. Access broker is the guy who's already inside you know, some of the networks. So he got together with the finance guy who's an expert in the crypto. Then they got together the, uh, the, the extraction guy and they started providing ransomware as a service. So while one person was doing it earlier, if you pay 10 to 15% to the ransomware as a service operators, then 100 people started doing ransomware attacks, 100 criminal-minded people. And even today as we speak, uh, one of our major power companies, the Tata Power Companies, is hit by a ransomware attack. Uh, in April, we had our second largest uh, public sector oil company uh, hit by a ransomware attack, and this is world over. You know what happened to Colonial Pipeline, etc. So th it, it became a national security issue. I mean, it crossed the threshold of crime, and ransomware has become a national security issue, which is why these uh, 37 countries have got together, and we have uh, created five verticals. I lead the vertical on resilience. There is a vertical on disruption, which is led by Australia a vertical on illicit finance, which is led by the UK. There's a vertical on cyber diplomacy by Germany, and a vertical on public-private partnership by Spain. And under each of these verticals, about 10, 12, 15 nations are there. And we made a plan as to how to go forward from here. We are meeting again in uh, DC on the 31st after a few days. And uh, the plan is to convert it into some sort of a task force and operationalize this. So it, it is a classic example of you know the coalition of the willing and uh, how to uh, beat the criminals. And we are very clear in our mind that we're not going to get these, let these guys get away with it. That's, that's, that's very clear. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Nela, coming to you, the general spoke about the, uh, the, the digital diplomacy part. As the digital ambassador, uh, where do you see the role for the small states in terms of the fact that we already have a, a schism emerging in the cyberspace management where we have Russia and China on one hand advancing one vision of the cyberspace and you have the West led by the US advancing one vision of the cyberspace. But we have some states which do not want to be identified either of with these two blocks. What kind of role do you see in, in the digital diplomacy for these states? Yes, thank you. Um, I think first um, I believe we shouldn't perhaps uh, strengthen so much on these differences uh, that we might have the, with these countries that, that we, we say are in the sort of the third block or, or gray area or, or uh, some other, other terms that have been, uh, have been recently coined. Uh, I believe that we all have also commonalities. So we should definitely start our partnership with them, finding these similarities that we have and agree as we have also done through already existing mechanisms, through the open-ended working group and, and, and many other initiatives that have been mentioned here in, uh, during, uh, during the day and I'm sure will also be, be mentioned uh, during the, the, the following uh, uh, day. So this work is, is an on, uh, ongoing um, uh, work um, uh, with these uh, countries that we put it somewhere, somewhere in, the, in the middle. But, uh, but I definitely see a partnership for several reasons. I was also uh, uh, referring um, in, my, in my opening statement that uh, perhaps can also go beyond the cy cyberspace issues that we have been uh, discussing here as, as we have also come to a conclusion in our discussions earlier that, uh, that uh, actually uh, the cybersecurity is so much interlinked with everything else we do uh, as the cyber attacks are increasingly reaching the entire public no longer critical infrastructure or, or, or public information systems or databases. It has become an issue of every single person. So actually one way to protect ourselves is to really have a strong digital society. And this is an experience that we can also take from, uh, from Estonia. Yes, we have built our cyber capacities, frameworks, policies, standards, and, and so forth. But every single person in Estonia uses also a secure digital identity. And this helps to protect our kindergartens, hospitals, um, and, um, and so forth. So 
the digital cooperation definitely is interlinked uh, also to, to, to building resilience and, and stronger um, uh, and, and more secure, let's say, digital uh, uh, society. But, uh, but my last point, uh, which I believe that uh, apart from uh, sharing experiences and, and having the multitude of, uh, of different experiences from different countries that we can learn from, it's ultimately uh, a matter of choice. Uh, because once you, you take uh, one side and, and that one particular side, uh, you will no, no longer have a choice. Uh, you, you are basically stuck on that one side and uh, there is no way back anymore. And I believe that all the countries, no matter which color zone they are, they still want to be able to make decisions over the developments that take place in their country. So, um, so in this uh, sense, I am uh, I'm positive and I'm, I'm sure we, uh, we will have uh, less countries in, the, in this gray or, or green zone. Thank you. Uh, coming to you, Yuka, uh, you spoke about Japan and the initiatives that it has taken. Uh, what are the two areas that you think the democracies in the Indo-Pacific should prioritize uh, to take forward the, the digital cooperation and also counter the Chinese influence? Sure. Um, I think there's two dimensions um, to this. And the other kind of binary discussion that we've been talking about throughout this conference on was the binary between um, you know, countries and cities having the, the most high-end advanced, for instance, digital infrastructure versus um, the areas and the countries and the cities that are still outside of this connectivity. And I think one of the initiatives um, that the Indo-Pacific countries or um, like-minded partners in the Indo-Pacific, um, like Japan, US, and Australia has been focusing on is the digital um, connectivity, um, especially around um, sustainable kind of um, debt um, financing structure um, for undersea cables, for instance. We, we, we often talk about 5G and, 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 and um, the high-end technologies, but if we look at it, actually the world's 99% of the data traffic goes through this undersea cables. And um, the, the problem was that um, no one country can just finance this massive uh, you know, infrastructure. So for instance, there, a good example is the US, um, Australia, Japan infrastructure financing partnership. And we've already seen um, for instance, initiatives like um, undersea cables in Palau or in the Micronesian three Micronesian countries um, in the Pacific Islands, and even just Japan alone, for instance, um, was promoting uh, digital connectivity um, within India and in from Chennai and and the remote islands already back in the, the late 2000, uh, I think around 2018, and the the project already co completed in 2020. So just the providing this basic digital connectivity is a very important thing um, to ensure prosperity um, and also ensure a trusted network system uh, to be developed in this very important uh, region. And then the second dimension is the more high-end side of the thing. So the problem of the 5G debate was that although the 5G is transformative because of the massive data that it can process, but also the low latency and the simultaneous connections um, that it can have beyond um, the device that, you know, mobile devices, but also it can connect cars and factories and houses. So it's the digital backbone of the society. So it's basically a critical infrastructure, but only a handful of companies can provide these technologies. So the di efforts to diversify the suppliers is a common shared interest across you know, the Indo-Pacific, but also globally. And um, I really like the ambassador's um, opening remarks about we also need to be thinking about being innovative. And for instance, there's technologies, and in most innovative technologies around telecommunications is, in, for instance, um, um, the one that, that uses, disaggregates the software and the hardware dimensions of 5G. And this is also helping diversify, uh, the diversification of vendors because by kind of disaggregating the whole system, several companies can actually take part to provide the components of network, um, the 5G network, for instance. It's also very um, applicable for Indo-Pacific countries, which is going to install these um, telecommunication systems from scratch because they can upgrade um, in principle, um, in theory, it can upgrade from 2G or 3G to um, 5G um, by just updating the software. So these are um, innovative approaches and, and new approaches that, uh, that and it can be, the Indo-Pacific can, you know, because of the massive population and, and young generation that is very digital savvy, it can be a kind of test and experimentation um, 
experimental um, venue for these innovative technologies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, coming to you, Adam. Adam, uh, you spoke about, and we, as we discussed in the morning, the new tech Cold War. Now, when you look at the US and some of the other federal democracies, how suitably they are equipped, or if I can use the word armed, to fight this uh, tech Cold War? Yeah, and when we spoke to Mar this morning, I said that I've written several pieces that were all headline tech Cold War, which I don't actually really like the title or the term. Um, I like to think of it as um, competition over networks, um, that the US and China are trying to plug into and grow sets of networks around specific technologies that are not going to overlap um, as a block or a tech cold war. Um, and in many ways, actually, the, the demands for that are much higher um, for expertise inside the government, for connections to the private sector, for connections to the private sector in other countries. Um, so while I think the Biden administration um, is, has done very well on the kind of typical side of building tech alliances, which again I think is the right thing to do, and has clearly done well on the domestic side to mobilize with the CHIPS Act, uh, I think there are, and no, no fault of the Biden administrations, there are just serious capability questions I think for all democracies. But, um, you know, as, as many people have pointed out, given the demands, for example, of the new chip sanctions, it's not clear BIS has the, cap the cap capabilities inside there to be able to figure out where the cutting edge is going to be as we move forward, which is the, 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 the question there. So uh, I think uh, talent is a, is a, huge, is a huge issue. Uh, structurally, uh, how and who should be uh, thinking about these uh, networks is, is a difficult right. We, we have just appointed a new cyber ambassador. Um, and so uh, the cyber ambassador has uh, rightfully talked about uh, public-private cooperation, and, but mainly focused on US companies, right? So kind of trying to uh, address the, the post-Snowden uh, hangover almost. Um, but there also has to be thinking about, again, uh, reaching out to other uh, things, so a bureaucracy issue, uh, and then finally, you know, just a U.S. attention problem. We're going to have another election, unfortunately. Uh, I can't promise you that um, we're going to have a president who's going to be interested in alliances um, for the next election. Uh, and so, you know, the long-term staying power of all the things we've been talking about, I think, are very, very unknown. Thank you. Now coming to you, Gilbert, uh, finally, uh, what Adam spoke about, the role of the businesses, right? Uh, I often ask this question, but, do, but I don't get a satisfactory answer on this. How do you involve the private sector in countering the tech influence of China? Because many of these companies don't want to get entangled into this geopolitical competition because they have certain business interests or they have certain you know, hesitancy when it comes to China. I mean, what can we do on that front? Oh, you know. I think I think it's good to to for example you know you're talking about the you know the supply chain I mean let's look at the supply chain right I mean uh, if you look at the supply chain for example uh, you realize for example why the cost becomes a, a factor right I mean why for example old uh, you know um, a company like um, um, Apple is producing, you know, a huge production. I mean, uh, in China, they, we understand uh, iPhone, really, there's a huge production of it is happening in China, right? So um, the, the, th the thing that comes there is cost, number one. Uh, is the cost structure. If you're not able to uh, have that cost of production as well, it uh, becomes a big issue. And most of the businesses that matter, you know, the existence, if you ask any CEO, the existence of most businesses is to return value to their shareholders. So as the businesses, most of them are pursuing profit, um, they, you know, they try not to be, to involve themselves in the geopolitical, um, uh, you know, uh, wars that sometimes exist between the bigger powers. And that's where uh, the regulation rather, you know, with clear frameworks uh, to find how do we ensure that maybe, for example, to even reduce some of these costs of production. And this goes all hand in hand with regards to uh, national, international policies. Because when you have clear policies, for example, some of these businesses will be able to say, okay, fine, we might uh, be able to empower you know, local productions uh, and uh, empower more of local, uh, um, uh, you know, talent. 
uh, to ensure that at least we don't outsource uh, heavily most of our production and cut off that supply chain uh, dependency. Unfortunately, in the global world, uh, we are quite hugely, hugely dependent uh, you know, on um, the global supply chain uh, structure, which of course in sense uh, brings the angle of uh, national security we're talking about. But the business from private perspective try to avoid that uh, conversation because as I say, the bottom line uh, really matters sometimes for the shareholders uh, than the, you know, the public goal analysis forced by government. I hope that uh, okay. clarifies. Okay. okay, thank you. So my colleagues are saying that five minutes are left, but because it's a dinner session and all the speakers are going to be here, so we can actually continue the conversation. But, you know, but as a the chair, I'm going to you know take maybe three questions from the floor so that we can have just uh, okay. I already have one, two. Okay, I'm going to start with Alice, and then you, and then. Thank you so much, uh, Alice Panier, French Institute of International Relations. I'd have a question for you, Gilbert, actually. Um, so you mentioned the, uh, the, the Chinese loans and how a Chinese technology, um, ch the Chinese uh, government is supporting the export of its technology through funding uh, development of smart cities in, in Africa. Uh, the European Union is trying to come up with its uh, Global Gateway Initiative and they're considering uh, whether their, uh, their um, development aid uh, in technology towards developing countries should also come with conditionality with regards to rules and regulations, for example, with regards to, to data privacy uh, and, and the like. And so I'm wondering, to, to in your view, how, how likely is it going to be successful if, if you're a developing country and you have a choice between um, a technology from China, for example, that may be cheaper and also comes no strings attached or no conditionality attached, and technology from Europe, uh, that will have this conditionality, and what do you think should be the, the way forward for Europe to try and, and, and put that initiative um, uh, in, in movement? Uh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. Come, come back to ma'am. Yeah, thank you. I'm Reena Dayal. I head the Quantum Ecosystems and Technology Council of India. And I heard uh, Lieutenant General Panth talk about quantum, but I didn't hear uh, from anybody else in the panel. And that kind of bothers me because if we're discussing cybersecurity and we're not talking about quantum, then you know, you know, we're looks like we're not very prepared. So a qu open question to the entire panel as to what do you think about uh, quantum and, and, and the kind of progress that uh, China has made on that considering that they've been spending, uh, I mean, at least that's what we know, $10 billion on the quantum program. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a retired professor and a former member of the ICANN board. Uh, we have a dilemma. We, have, we live in the age of cyber interdependence, but everybody wants now to be independent from the enemy. So that means how to uh, settle this conflict. So that means you say China is weaponizing interdependence. And as a former ICANN board member, I fully agree with Gilbert when he said even weaponizing standardization, you know, if you want to substitute the TCP IP protocol with new internet protocol, then you do not want to have a cake from the DNS, you want to have the whole bakery. And that's, that's a big difference. But uh, interdependence means dependence on both sides. That means what democracies can do that interdependence feeds democracy <laughs> and undermines autocracy. Do you have a master plan? <laughs> that can be a separate session altogether, but <laughs> thank you. Uh, Gilbert, I'm going to start with you and then I'm going to come from this order to talk about the quantum. Yeah, so no, this is a tough question. And uh, it goes back to how um, I think the West has always uh, treated Africa and um, uh, developing countries. You know, why most of the uh, maybe European projects or Western projects have always failed is because they build dams for people who need a fish pond. Okay, I, I'll come to that and let just allow me to do that. Because the problem we face in Africa, for example, cost is an issue. So when someone comes with them uh, with this, for example, with the, uh, without uh, maybe uh, being, um, you know, focused on, let's say, the rule of law, most of the African, uh, rather, or rather, you know, more the poor countries will tend to take or go with the person who is giving them that option. Now, the concessional loan approach um, that China is using is not new. 
I mean, the, 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 the Italian government used it on Kenya when they were building a dam. So it's not new. However, the aggressivity with which China is using it makes it much more uh, have them at an advanced stage compared to the Western partners who, uh, when you find the way they will deal or dealing with um, developing countries, governance is always an issue. Number two is always issue of transparency. Unfortunately, we're in part of a world where sometimes transparency becomes still an issue on how maybe some of the government, uh, the projects are being run and where interest sometimes, and these are things that might not sit sometimes well with the Western powers. So you find that most of these leaders who sit in some of these institutions tend to uh, want to, you know, because some of them also um, uh, value, auto, you know, uh, you know, uh, autocracy, you know, in the sense where sometimes they want to uh, not allow their people to have that uh, level of I decision making. There are cases where there are contracts that have been signed by African states. To date, uh, citizens don't even know what were some of those terms of agreement were. So this, is, I think, is the challenge we are facing where we need to ensure that at least uh, the Western powers need to understand that for us to counter the Chinese influence, we need to be able to uh, understand uh, where, how do we um, ensure that uh, these uh, programs, if, if we want to engage with Africa, they are not just um, with our own view, but with also stakeholder engagement. I think there's been a lot of failed projects from Western world because they were designed with people who are sitting in um, DC in AC rooms and coming to implement them in the continent. I think that's a problem. Thank you. 30 seconds on quantum for all of you. Sure, uh, no, th thank you very much for raising that. Um, one of the cha big challenges for 5G was the, that security standard, a standard was not very clear. And um, in terms of beyond 5G, that's the, the way Japan calls that 6G standard, especially um, they're considering quantum, especially around quantum key distribution. Now there's debate between whether quantum computing, the, the decoding side, you know, which is more strong in, in encoding, in t quantum key dis distribution and encoding and then decoding, which is stronger, uh, we, we don't know yet. And we haven't seen the full spectrum of 5G yet, but in terms of 6G standard setting, quantum has become a key focus for some countries like Japan. Thank you. Thank you. So. So I think Yuka's uh, said it in quantum, there are three areas, as you're aware, quantum computing, quantum communications, and quantum cryptography, which includes the quantum key distribution. And quantum computing will be one of the most closely guarded secrets of any nation. Uh, today, IBM is saying 100 qubits, Chinese will say something else. And the reason is that that leads to the breaking of the cryptography. So nobody will tell you what is the capability that they've got. But the fact is clear that uh, the importance is is is... Uh, there for all of us to see, and uh, lots of things are happening, including satellite communications, etc. Yara, thirty seconds. I will uh, just quickly comment uh, on the partnerships and digital cooperation, and also the, the global gateway that uh, was mentioned, and uh, and also the response to to my uh, to my seconds, friend and colleague uh, that uh, what has happened there has been sort of disconnect really between the values that we promote and the principles, and actually these mechanisms that we have had. So what I would like to say is that let's, let's talk more after the session and we make the Global Gateway work. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, quantum uh, communications, the Chinese are clearly ahead, but it's also an area that the US basically decided wasn't worth going into. Um, and I would say on quantum computing, uh, I agree with General Pond, we don't really know for sure, but again, I think the US is clearly ahead on commercial and commercial applications. The uh, Chinese ecosystem is not really there uh, yet, and the US is probably uh, significantly ahead. Thank you so much. As it happens, we have run out of time, but I mean, the speakers are here, so you are most welcome to interact uh, with them. Thank you so much. The dinner is served. Thank you. Have a nice evening ahead. Thank you.